Good evening, everyone. I am Michael Sakamoto, Interim Director of Programming and Director of the Asian and Asian American Arts and Culture Program at the UMass Fine Arts Center. Welcome to the second of two events with author and Japanese cultural expert Alex Kerr, this evening in conversation with scholar Bruce Baird on Japanese arts and popular culture. These talks are co-presented with the support of the Five College Center for East Asian Studies. This winter and spring, the Fine Arts Center presents over 40 virtual performances, artist talks, exhibitions, and special events for students, the UMass and Five College community, and the general public, all free or low priced. Check out fineartscenter.com for more info. We begin this broadcast by acknowledging that the University of Massachusetts, Amherst stands on traditional Nonotuk land, and we recognize our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohican, and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abnaki to the north. Further, we acknowledge through language courtesy of Groundwater Arts that YouTube, the platform we're using today in many days, is headquartered in what is now called San Bruno, California, on the traditional lands of the Ohlone and Tamian peoples. We acknowledge these lands that YouTube resides on because the work we create together in the digital platform does not exist in an ether or imaginary void, but is made possible because of physical land and the indigenous people who steward it. Our featured guest tonight, Alex Kerr, is an American writer and Japanologist whose previous books include Lost Japan and Another Kyoto, co-written with Kathy Arlen Sokol. He was the first foreigner to be awarded the Shincho Gakuge Literature Prize for the best work of nonfiction published in Japan. In Alex's final year as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University in Chinese Studies, his essay on Tibet won the Oxford Chancellor's English Essay Prize, the first time it had been awarded to an American. Thus began his career as a writer. Moving to Kyoto in 1977, Alex worked for 20 years, helping to manage the Oomoto School of Traditional Japanese Arts. During this period, Alex explored his interests in kabuki, calligraphy, and art collecting, experiences which went into the book Lost Japan. Alex continues to collect and sell Japanese paintings and calligraphy, as well as tie crafts and modern design, as well as running a screen mounting studio, first in Kyoto and now in Bangkok. In the 1980s, Alex also served as advisor to Trammel Crow's art collection and later managed his company's operations in Japan during the bubble years of the 80s and 90s. This background in business influenced his later book, Dogs and Demons, which combined a study of finance and bureaucracy with cultural issues to show that Jap Japan's modern malaise arises from the same causes in both fields. After two decades visiting Thailand, Alex also began focusing on arts of Southeast Asia, and especially Thailand, moving his base from Kyoto to Bangkok in 1997. He now splits his time between the two countries and different activities, speaking at events in Japan and elsewhere, and consulting for provincial Japanese towns and cities that want to improve their environment. Since 2004, Alex has restored 25 houses in Kyoto, Ia Valley, Ojika Island in nagasaki -en, and elsewhere. Alex also manages the origin program of traditional Asian arts in three places as origin uh, program in Bangkok and Chiang Mai, Thailand for Thai and Lona traditional arts, as well as the Kyoto program in venues in and around Kyoto for Japanese traditional arts. Our moderator this evening, Bruce Baird, uh, received his BA from Columbia University and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Bruce's research interests include Japanese dance and buto, Japanese philosophy, Japanese new media studies, and performance. Uh, Bruce's teaching includes Japanese theater, manga and anime, video games, and Japanese film. His book, Hijikata Tatsumi and Buto, Dancing in a Pool of Grey Grits, is a lively examination of the formation of the dance form Buto, one of the most important forms of the 20th century. In the book, 
Bruce argues that Buto should be seen as a bodily response to the conflicts of Japan in the 1960s to 80s and as an embodiment of the information age. This book was nominated for the 2013 Biannual International Convention of Asian Scholars Book Prize. Bruce is currently working on a broader history of Buto, which will examine how the art changed and evolved as it spread beyond Tokyo to the world. Bruce is the recipient of two Fulbright Fellowships. The Fine Arts Center remains more committed than ever to the students and the five college community. And our work depends on gifts to the Fine Arts Center. So if you're able, please consider a donation in support of our public mission at fineartscenter.com slash giving. UMass Fine Arts Center is supported by the New England Foundation for the Arts, through the New England Arts Resilience Fund, part of the United States Regional Arts Resilience Fund, an initiative of the U.S. Regional Arts Organizations, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, with major funding from the Federal CARES Act from the National Endowment for the Arts. Don't forget to visit fineartscenter.com to join other events and exhibitions in our spring season. And now, I am pleased to introduce Alex Kerr and Bruce Baird. Michael, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm, I just wanna start off and give a sense about where we're going today uh, I teach a Japanese um, uh, comic book and um, animation class, manga and anime class. And in part, Alex is a special guest coming to this class, but I know there are a lot of other people out there. Um, and uh, so this, I, I just wanna say, I mean, thank you so much to Alex for coming here and also thank you to the Fine Arts for hosting us. Um, and can we get the, uh, PowerPoint up. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you can just skip right to the next next slide here. Okay, so one of the big questions in the field of Japanese, um, you know, comic books and animation studies has basically been why is it that Japanese, uh, you know, animators have seemed to prefer two D animation even when they could make the jump to th 3D volumetric animation. And so I'll just give you two examples here. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and next slide, um, no, next slide. Okay, now hold on for just a second. Don't press play just yet. I basically, so the last slide, this is Miyazaki's, a very famous. The next slide, I just nearly picked something completely at random from my, um, anime collection. This is Maria Hollick from 2008. All right, let's hit it. It shouldn't be the choice of this. I mean, be the thing that makes this choice. Okay, so that's the background. And scholars have been wondering why that's the case. So let's head to the next slide. Okay, so possible answers. One is just um, budget. And it's very clear that um, the budget matters here. Um, Japanese animation studios are at a competitive disadvantage with um, uh, places like Dix Disney and Pixar. Um, but budget won't quite explain all of it because like I said, even when you would seem to be in an era when, you know, you could do CGI or something like that um, and massage this, they're not jumping to 3D volumetric animation. So the next option is that they are in fact um, responding to um, international art currents. And certainly these animators are, are aware of things like abstract expressionism and cubism. And so they may be taking from international arts a kind of painterly or like surface focus and drawing that into their animation. Um, but then the third option, is that maybe there's something about the prior arts that makes 2D seem like an acceptable option. Um, and there's lots of, um, you know, I'll just, you know, scroll through a, a few, a very few like, you know, sort of things, but um, we have um, scroll-based arts in Japan, we have um, woodblock prints in Japan. So one theory is that in fact, these make Japanese consumers um, sort of friendly to 2D um, animations. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick example of scroll-based arts. This is um, uh, originally from a Buddhist scroll, 
And what you notice is on the one side of the image, you have the text, which tells you, you know, curtail your desires. And then the other side, you have this um, heavenly punishment um, God um, who will, you know, if you don't curtail your desires, he'll just bite your body in half after you die. Okay, next slide. Um, the, that's um, a quite old slide, the previous slide. Um, this, we're moving into the era of woodblock um, technology in the 1600s. Um, and this is um, a just a, a, spread, a page spread from this, um, what's called a kibyoshi. And um, what you notice here is this mixture of words and images in this. And the people who, um, they have the, op I mean, in theory, they have the option um, because by, you know, 1755, there's movable type. They, they, in theory, have the option of movable type, but they prefer woodblock prints because what it allows them to do is put this writing, this kind of cursive, um, Japanese writing with um, a um, an image. Okay, so next slide, please. All right, so again, possible answers are budget, um, international arts, and then something about the prior arts that makes you know this sort of two D um, you know like orientation seem viable. But then uh, the reason we brought Alex Kerr here today is because he might have an interesting extra, um, you know, like way in which we can think about the sort of like general artistic environment of Japan that may be a good explanation, maybe a good explanation for why Japan has leaped into this manga and anime world. So with that, I'll let Alex take over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've raised some really interesting questions. And uh, I've put together two little presentations about two different aspects of traditional arts that may or may not really apply to uh, uh, manga and anime. And maybe we can leave that up to the discussion later, see what people feel about it. But it does apply to an awful lot of other stuff uh, in contemporary arts and, and even Buto and all the rest of it. So these are, I think, uh, thought provoking, uh, deeper, levels of Japanese culture that precede prints and all the rest of it is something that goes back a, bit, uh, a lot further. Uh, so uh, the first one, let me open it up and then I'll get the screen sharing. Okay, share. Share screen. Um, Hmm. Oh, wait a minute. No. Ah. Huh. Excuse me, I'm not managing this very well. Can you see the, uh, can you see it? Do, what do you see, me or or the presentation? I, Alex, I see you and me still. Okay, then that's not good. Sorry. Share. Share. Ah, now it should work. Okay, now what do you see? We got you. Oh. I'm sorry. We have, we have your presentation. It's good. Ah, and, and it says Shingo So, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Shingyo So is uh, what I want to talk about. And uh, what it actually goes back to is something pretty basic, namely geography. Uh, you know, Japan uh, had a problem, still has a problem, in that nothing original ever started here, even Shinto. All of it came from somewhere. And uh, of course, uh, until uh, you know, the Western countries influence came in. It was coming overwhelmingly from China and also from Korea. And the Japanese found these incredibly advanced and refined and technologically sophisticated objects such as the ceramics coming in. And then they, from China, and then they would look at, uh, and there's a, another uh, 
very sophisticated Chinese piece. And then they would look at what came from Korea, which was similar to China, but a bit rougher. And then they looked at their own ceramics, which were really crude sort of, you know, lumps of earth. And then it applied, and it applied to, for example, architecture. So here's the grandeur and complexity of the Forbidden City. And the same thing, a little more kawaii in Korea. And then, you know, what do you get? The most important shrine, really the most important building of all Japan is the Imperial Shrine of Ise, but it's thatched. It's not even tiled. So they looked, they asked this question, well, who are we? And the answer they came up with in the, uh, the tea masters came up with it in the, in the 1500s. They looked at calligraphy, which has these three forms, shin, gyo, and so, which are formal, informal, and cursive. Uh, and this went back 2000 years in China, uh, but they took this uh, paradigm. Uh, here's examples. Uh, you can see shin, the character for shin, written in shin, gyo, and so forms. And you see how it, it devolves from a very detailed uh, angular kind of writing into something very soft and fluid and, and a kind of shorthand. And the same thing with the grass character. So Shinyo and So, they took that paradigm. And of course, we have it all over the world. This isn't unique to Japan. If you look at the three orders of, of uh, classical Western architecture, you had the, the Doric, uh, sorry, well, the Doric would be very simple, but that's more of a so. And then the gyo uh, would be the, the ionic in between. And Corinthia, which is very elaborate, would be shin. And we also have it nowadays, you know, in clothing. You can wear a suit and tie or you can wear jeans or something in between. So we, we instinctively apply this to daily life uh, everywhere. But the Japanese applied it to everything. And so the tea master said, okay, a Chinese bronze would be shin a Korean ceramic would be go, and Japan would be bamboo. So they defined Japan as so. They said, we are so in comparison with China and Korea. And of course, geographically worked out nicely because China's a continent, Korea's a peninsula, and Japan's an island. Uh, so even there, you had Shingyo and so. Uh, then, with it, then you could break it up further. So within ceramics, you could have a Shin form of ceramic, which would be perfect form, highly polished. Gyo would be kind of, the basic form is there, but the glaze is a bit rougher. And then So, which is the rough form and the blotchy glaze. And of course, So is your classical Japanese raku ware pottery, which is the highest pottery at tea ceremony. They applied it to flower arrangement, you put, which is not only the jar that you put them in, but how the flowers go vertical in for shin, slanted a bit for gyo, flopping all over the place uh, for so, and even the types of flowers change. So so would be, for example, wild flowers, roadside flowers. They applied it to painting. So shin painting is very detailed, every leaf, uh, every rock, gyo is uh, more impressionistic. And then for so they did something they called splash ink. It's just a blotch here and a dab there, and boom, you have a, a mountain. Uh, in architecture, you could have a Shin palace, a Go townhouse, or a So farmhouse. And the thing was that what they, uh, in this sort of identity crisis that Japan had when they decided, we yes, we are So, uh, they realized that their most important palaces are not tiled, they're thatched. Uh, their greatest pottery was low-fired raku ware and so on. Uh, in design, for example, this would be a shin, gyo, and so approach. Uh, shin, they're all nicely arranged symmetrically. Gyo is broken up a bit. So they don't even bother to do four. It's three and kind of thrown together. Uh, in walkways, I mean, you can see it. It just, it, it, you see it all over the place uh, in Japan in every genre. And they play, and of course you can see it very much in gardens. So here's your Chinese sculptural, vertical, dynamic stone rising up to the sky, and then the Japanese sort of formless blobs, quiet, sunken in the earth, uh, horizontal and vertical, movement and stillness. All these, these contrasts show up, as, especially when, when you leave go out of the formula. Uh, and so, you can also think of it in other ways with paintings. So shin would be refined and balanced, like these literati uh, doing their, you know, ever so uh, 
um, scholarly pursuits. And then you have these uh, outrageous paintings by, for example, 18th century painter Shohaku. And this never happened in China. The Chinese just, uh, you couldn't get away with this in China. You had to be more proper. In Japan, uh, the drama was the fun of it. Uh, the, it was just completely, you know, wild stuff. Look at that hat. Uh, I mean, look at what Shohaku has done with a dragon. And that was a so style breakdown of painting. It was where you were released from all those rules. Uh, you can also see Shin versus So as pictorial versus abstract. So if we look at modern art, here's Ai Weiwei and Ando Tadao. It's not a perfect combination because it's it, uh, art uh, object versus a architecture, but still Ai Weiwei, although it's obviously abstract and contemporary, it's still depicting something. And it also has a highly relevant uh, political message. Anto Tatao is a purely abstract, uh, non-conceptual, uh, just lines, lines in space. Uh, that would be Shin versus So in, in modern art. Uh, Japanese art is, uh, is um, uh, has tended the successful, powerful Japanese uh, contemporary art that has influenced the world is, is extremely abstract. Uh, out, like this piece by Suki, uh, photo by Sukimoto Hiroshi. You could hardly push abstract photography much further uh, than this. Look at uh, Issei Miyake, that actually is a dress. You put it on and it becomes a dress. Uh, so they've pushed abstraction to the limit and that is uh, the um, uh, Japan's forte. It's the direction that Japan took that nobody else, uh, especially in Asia, really could. In ceramics, uh, the two greatest modern Japanese ceramicists, one of them is Fukami Sueharu, does pure shin, polished, elegant, uh, absolutely, you know, perfection. And then you have Raku Kichizaimo, the 15th generation of the Raku, doing this, uh, you know, uh, rough stuff. But they actually both tell me uh, that the other one is the only one who understands them. So within shin is uh, so, and within so is shin. Another way to look at it, and this might apply a little bit more, now we're getting more into anime uh, uh, territory, although the drama is part of it. Portraiture, uh, you could see Shin as being serious, Gyo as being just normal, and then So as being comic. So Chinese portraiture would be hieratic and grand. The Japanese went in for sketchy, eccentric, humorous approaches. So for example, the great uh, monk Sengai did these just complete kind of funny sketches. Again, it happened once or twice in China, but quickly disappeared. In Japan, it actually became the mainstream of a certain kind of literati art during Edo. Uh, Hakuin uh, is just completely playful stuff. And of course, it goes way, way back. So the 12th century Chochu Giga, which is sometimes called Japan's first manga, which is by a very, not, not uh, it wasn't what you'd call popular art. It was by an important aristocratic habit. But even at that early point, uh, Japan was going for the comic and the sketchy in a way that, uh, for example, China never did. The Hohigasen, another very early, it's 12th century, you know, just outrageous stuff. And so this tendency towards the comic, the erotic, uh, the playful uh, was always in Japanese art. And then and then you get kabuki and the art of the townspeople. And so at this point, the ethos, the tea ceremony and earlier ethos of so meets up with, you could call it pop art. And uh, you and, and then it really goes crazy. And so the prints are just over the top, uh, you know, ghosts and uh, uh, people turning in, in funny postures. Of course, this kind of uh, thing, which we see a lot in, uh, in manga and anime, and these uh, very, very creative uh, uh, sort of construction uses of space, the way the stones uh, uh, kind of flare outwards and all this. Uh, th this is derived from, this is the, they're, they're building on that base of so, and now making it more decorative and popular. And you end up with, uh, for example, kabuki actors uh, shown as waterfalls. Uh, and so that's it for Shingyo So. Let me end this slideshow. Yes. So we can talk 
a little bit about uh, later on about how that might relate to the question of why they didn't go for 3D. Now, the next one is sliding doors. Uh, here we go back to, again to something very basic, which is your original Japanese farmhouse, which is completely dark. Uh, Tanizaki wrote a famous essay in praise of shadows, saying that all of Japanese art came out of the darkness. And certainly when you look at the old houses, it did. The eaves come practically to the ground. Uh, this is, I have an old thatched house in the mountains of Shikoku. This is it. And you can see that hundreds of years of smoke have darkened every, everything. The walls, the ceiling, the floors, as if they were lacquered black. And they, so they craved light. And then Japan then developed, the architecture opened up. And they opened up the sides and they uh, invented shoji, which has thin uh, rice paper pasted on, on a lattice. So this is a shoji room looking out into a garden. And the next thing they invented were the fusuma, which are solid uh, doors, uh, papered lattice, but, but you don't see through them. They just have a big piece of white paper on them. And they turned everything white. And in fact, th there was a, a, a rule that, that fusuma should always be white in the early days. But naturally, uh, once you get into the uh, Muamachi and the feudal lords are building grand palaces, they don't want just white, uh, they want this. And so they begin painting very uh, grandly with gold and, and pigments, every single square surface, uh, 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 open surface, which were mostly fusuma. And one of the uh, biggest uh, sort of needs for fusuma was in the so-called shichu, which are the abbot's quarters, of Zen temples. And a shichu was huge. There were hundreds of square meters to paint on. But basically you were painting the Sistine Chapel every time. And so Japan now had a new uh, artistic problem, which was until then, everything was painted on, on hanging scrolls, Chinese style, which meant compression. So you took a huge image of mountains and you squeezed it down uh, into the small space of the scroll, but with big horizontal um, uh, fusuma sliding doors that literally, let's say, covered hundreds of meters, expansion was what you had to do. And here's what happens, for example, at Yoanji. Uh, there's vast spaces. And so they invented certain techniques in order to conquer the sheer space and, and, and not to bore the viewer. And one of them was what I call the diagonal slash. And you see it in prints, and, and it's, it strikes me. I don't, uh, uh, I'm not a specialist of anime, but just visually, when I look at, uh, sorry, manga, you'll often see a page di sliced diagonally with one thing on one side, another on another. That's a relic on a small scale of what started out as, as a way of, 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 of making use of big scale spaces. Another thing that happened was dramatic exaggeration. Again, you, uh, the, the big, the huge fusuma would defeat you unless you could come up with something pretty outrageous. And so here, for example, they turned uh, mountains into rectangles and squares. Uh, they, they had a, a dragon, coming out of mist fill the whole space. And here you can see that in effect at Ryoanji. Another thing to keep in mind, and this may have again something to do with the 2D aspect, is Japan's wooden architecture is open pillars, uh, very few walls anyway. Where the walls were were basically the fusuma and shoji put into slats on the floor, but they could be removed. And so what really, uh, what's, what's really there structurally is pillars. And so when you looked out uh, from, from a class traditional space, uh, you saw the gardens or the landscape through pillars, or, at, or if it was glassed in later on through the, through the frames. Uh, but one way or another, this was how you saw the outside. And then it turns out that fusma have lacquered wooden uh, frames around them. So you also saw a landscape painting as segmented with uh, frames and even screens where you can clearly see the segmentation uh, with the, uh, the joints in the paper of the six panels. And so, they, so gardens then were viewed as 2D paintings. Yes, it is 3D, but it has been literally framed and segmented 
the, the very famous borrowed scenery garden at Ensuji Temple in Kyoto, you've turned a 3D garden into a 2D painting, just as if you were looking at a scroll screen. Uh, it's, we're seeing it a little on the side, but the same thing has happened here in the sand garden of Daisen in, in Kyoto. And you can uh, ver see very much the famous Ryoanji rock garden is perfectly framed. You could hang it on the wall. Techniques of painting and gardening then began to resemble each other. So they had rounded Japanese style mountains, then they would paint them. They had the real mountains and they would paint them and then they would copy those mountains in the form of azaleas. But again, that's a 2D uh, painted view. Uh, they even took that splash ink that I was talking about earlier, the splash ink technique of a few uh, dots of black ink on white paper now became a few dots of black stone on white sand. Uh, but the techniques are uh, the visual effect of it is similar. And another thing, that, and, and this we could maybe talk about if we have time today, which is a result of the fact that everything is movable. So the shojis and the fusumas would slide left and right and even up and down, revealing disparate views. So at the one, so the, in this space where we're looking, if you look at this space on the left, we have a, a literati shelf that you could put uh, ceramics and things on. You have the tatami floors, you have a bit of wall, you have shoji and you have garden. They're all completely different and yet somehow equally hold our attention. And so you get, and uh, in other words, people lived in these zigzag spaces. This is my home actually where we're talking. And you get, you get the zigzag effect, big fusma, small fusma. You look a little in the distance, you see a screen there and then the garden. Uh, you're looking uh, through zigzag spaces. Uh, they invented the yukimi shoji, which they really call snow viewing openings. And, and they actually open and shut. Uh, so you may or may not see through to the garden. And of course, then it becomes very Baroque in tea rooms. This is the uh, famous 13 window tea room of of, uh, of, of Kyoto, uh, and you can see many, many different formats. It, it wasn't just one sort of window. Uh, they might break it into, uh, you know, a few bamboo segments or many. Uh, and then, of course, there's shojis here and there. Uh, it's, it's done, the, the ultimate Baroque example of it is the Katsura Palace in Kyoto, which is just a complete mix of, of boxes. I call these, by the way, I call these little views and these little inset things portals in the sense that uh, it takes you into another, a completely another space. And I wanted to show you, it's a little one minute video. Uh, in my valley up in Ia where that old house is, uh, they used to, uh, they had a little stage, but there, no actors would ever go there. So they did a whole play using Fusuma, moving the Fusuma. Fusuma Karakuri wa さて横に回転させたりすることで次々に違う情景を作り出す家の伝統芸能ですあの近本堂は地元住民らで作る実行委員会は公園には観光客を中心におよそ フスマは標識の音に合わせて裏方が糸を巧みに使い動かします。フスマを交互に縦横に回転させて。Yes. And then it got into paintings. So here you see a, a, a mishmash, right? You've got uh, calligraphy panels and painting panels. And uh, this screen of, of plum, which is in my living room at this moment, I'm looking at it. Notice how the poetry plaques have just been pasted pretty much at random on top of the painting with not too much regard actually for the painting, although in a way it's very, there is a subtle sense of balance. Uh, but these are again, portals stuck here and there 
uh, on a painting. Uh, and then you get to prints where you see this constantly. And so uh, here, for example, uh, when, you, when we get up close to it, you can see how there are many, many different things going on. There's writing, <coughs> there are other, uh, if you look at the one on the right, uh, you have the title in red, you have uh, two uh, poetry plaques, one covering the other, and both of those kind of at, at random with regard to the, the, the print itself. Uh, it, it goes on in many, many uh, styles, uh, but, but it's a very constant uh, use of space, these uh, zigzag or, or kind of random portals of this and that laid on top of each other. And here's uh, a print from the 19, uh, around 1900. Thank you. And that's the end of the second one. So we've got kind of two things going on, uh, just kind of sum those up. Uh, you've got the uh, Shingyo So uh, tradition, Japan seeing itself as So and not Shin, uh, which is to say going for the untechnological, going for the primitive, the simple, and, and so on. And then there's the other aspect, which was how people lived uh, in these uh, houses with pillars. And because of the pillars, they had the slip. By the way, Japan invented the sliding door. I don't know of any other culture in the world that ever had it until modern times. And because of the sliding doors, you then end up with this kind of uh, zigzag overlay of portals and so on, which, which then gets into art. So those are the two themes I thought I'd throw out. Uh, sorry, I don't hear you, Bruce. Wow, Alex, that was fantastic. I mean, I can only imagine that all of us, you know, like spread out all over who are watching, were just blown away by this. Um, the the Karakuri, uh, the Fusuma, um, you know, like show. Oh my gosh, that's just wonderful. Over the top, isn't it? <laughs> Well, over the top, but but also so amazing. Um, I want I want to know. Um, actually, I, I'm sure that um, our audience is um, has some questions, and I've also co collected a few questions from my students. But I want to be selfish enough to have a few questions of my own before we get to those. Um, I wonder if you would mind pulling your um, your. Um, presentation back and going to that Itsuji okay. slide. Okay, yes. Was, was, is that uh, what you do? Let me, let, I'll, I'll, I'll find it just a minute. We'll go up to Itsuji, 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 where is it? Here it is. Yeah. I mean. Can you see it? Yeah, yeah, I think we yeah. can see it, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean no, are we still sharing? What's that? We're still sharing so you can see it, right? Yeah. We can definitely see it. Okay, what good. So amazing to me about this is how you know we you know we don't have any movement in this picture because it's just a photograph, but mm. um, the way that the the mountain um, looks like its own plane, and then the the trees in the hedge look like they're a plane, and it almost could be this you know kind of Miyazaki. Um, animated like it's it's fascinating to me how uh, i mean fantastic like these could be almost doubled up it's almost like yeah. if you just ran a deer you know if ya um <laughs> if you know like ashitaka were on yakul and ran through this we would have a miyazaki um yes. you know like animation it's it's fantastic to look mm -hmm. at the, the the planes that you have in this garden design. Well, you've put your finger actually on a critical aspect of this. I was talking about the 2D-ness of it, but there's actually another aspect, which is this is an incredibly sophisticated garden because it's actually playing with Shingyo So in this way. Uh, Shin would be uh, polished and man-made Right, that would be the closer garden, which is all very arranged, very perfectly, and you know, perfectly pruned moss and all that. Gyo would be a little bit wilder, which is the bamboo stuff in the middle, and so would be a com complete nature, the nature of a mountain, right? Uh, 
shin go, you'd also have near, middle distance, and far. Uh, all of which, and then you have low, medium, and high, earth, middle, and heaven. <laughs> all of these levels are playing on each other. Yeah, it's just fantastic to, to, I mean, think about this, like Miyazaki shot that I showed in the beginning, yeah. then see this garden design. Oh my gosh, it's it's stunning is what it is. Um, thank you so much for this. So the other thing I'm struck by as I watch your presentation mm -hmm. is really the way that um, there's all of these uses of space. You know, you have these poetry placards and then you have, um, and so you can, and, and it's it's okay to just set that thing right in the middle yeah. of a, you know, of a picture of a tree, you know, of a plum. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow um, in that, in, in this like sort of like you're describing um, um, this, you know, like one level is abstraction and then one level is like detail. And somehow in that impulse to abstraction, it was okay to just plant this thing, which doesn't have anything to do with the tree right in there. And of course you noted that, you know, it kind of tracks the tree a little bit, like as if, you know, they're like hanging poetry placards off the tree. It's not quite random, but it's very fascinating what they're doing here. I wonder if you say a little bit more about um, that use of how how they got to that use of space. Okay, well, let me go back to that one too, actually, so that we can look at it while I talk. Just a minute, please. Da, 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 da. Where's that poetry thing? I mean, okay, here. So uh, the second one actually shows it a little better. Okay, I call it the Mondrian effect. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. You know how Mondrian would just drill would look like random vertical and horizontal lines, and yet it had a mysterious, that perfect balance to it. And that's what's going on here. They don't, they're not really following the tree. They're just somehow following the overall space, but in a in a Mondrian-esque, random but satisfying way. And of course, I think that came from the zigzag cut and paste view of this and that kind of environment that they lived in. And you see it, it just very much here. Wow. I mean, it's it's really, uh, one of the things I like about what you're putting forward in this Another Kyoto book is th there's almost this sense that, um, I mean, it's like you say, like the daily life of someone ends up in some way, you know, like finding its way into their art. And so if you have these, 2D paintings on your walls, but also you have this, you know, you can have a door here and then you can have a space which reaches out to a farther, um, you know, a further distance. You yeah. know, you have these views. And then, I, I mean, what seems like what you're arguing here is really that that daily life, right? It just comes right into their art and it changes their art into something that nobody else has. Well, th exactly. And one of the uh, things that that I find, for example, when when I'm people write about Japanese art, they say, "Oh, you know, Japanese art is uh, full of uh, abstraction or this and that." Well, it is now, but it wasn't earlier. Uh, at least, uh, the, the, for example, um, this kind of thing did not exist at an earlier phase, and it didn't exist until they had Tatami and Fusuma and Shoji. <laughs> So in an earlier phase of Japan, they weren't living it. They were just living in dark and closed spaces, right? But it, once they started living in the zigzag portal-filled portal, portal -filled, uh, rooms, then they invented this kind of art. And then once it was all around them, uh, then it just developed. And by the time you get into the prints, it's just really zany. I mean, every variety, every variation can happen. So um, I would, you know, like to talk with you for like a long more time and just like monopolize all of it myself. But I, you know, we have some people out there with us. Um, some of my students, um, my students um, are very curious about what got you into this in the first, I mean, what got you into studying Japanese art? And also um, um, we have a YouTube questioner who's saying, why did you specifically um, focus on Kyoto? 
as opposed to, you know, some other um, city or something like that. So what got you into this? We want to. Um, so uh, I since I was a little boy, nine years old, I, uh, I happened to go to a school where they taught us Chinese kids, you know, Chinese. And then when I was 12, we moved to Japan. And I've been basically in and out and mostly in Japan since then. So it's now 50 some years, <laughs> 56 years in Japan at this point. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd, I'd have to say I didn't choose it. It chose me. I mean, by the time I was knew anything at all, I was already here. But I was fascinated and I loved it. But my focus is not just on Japan. So my, my, my field in college was Chinese studies and I spend uh, close to half of each year in Thailand. So I'm very involved in Southeast Asian uh, studies. And I've also written about Thailand, about Chinese art. And by the way, my starting point is not Kyoto. It's Ia, this valley in Shikoku where that black empty house is, right? And that's actually my core interest. And I've written about that too. So we just happen to be talking about Kyoto today uh, which is why Kyoto features, uh, maybe seems to feature uh, pretty strongly. Uh, also, uh, with regard to, to fine arts, right, uh, painting and calligraphy and all that kind of thing, Kyoto was the imperial capital for a thousand years, and so the best and the gardens and the Zen and so on, that is found in Kyoto. Kyoto is where the best of it is. So that, that's why Kyoto, as, as far as this goes. Remember, the prints are not a Kyoto thing. They're Edo. That was Tokyo. Thank you. Uh, so, um, what I mean, you kind of already um, touched on this. One of my students was wanting to know about, you know, like how the Shingyo so um, manifested itself in modern arts. And you already, you know, like brought up some fantastic, um, you know, slides from contemporary ceramics and things like that. But, mm. um, one of my students is asking, um, do you what do, what do you notice, not necessarily just in manga and anime, but in pop cultural forms, um, what kind of Shingyo and so do you notice? Oh. Did we lose you? Oh, oh sorry. I'm, I'm losing you. There's a problem with the Wi-Fi. Let me uh, try to fix that. Uh, seems like I'm on my own all of a sudden. <laughs> Please. Oh, there we are. Good. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Would you repeat that question? My Wi-Fi went off. Oh, um, so what I, um, we saw in your slideshow that you already, um, brought up some slides of uh, Shingyo and so in contemporary art, in ceramics. Um, but one of, of the students um, would like to know about um, whether you notice Shingyo and so in other popular culture, not necessarily manga and anime, but in yeah. any other sort of popular culture realms. That's an interesting question. I think I'd almost like to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> but one place we could maybe go is Buto. Mm -hmm. I mean, Buto is is pure so. It's as so as you can get, with regard to human movement, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, it's instinctual. Somehow Japan just keeps going for so. And we know that Hijikata despised traditional culture and had no interest in Kabuki no and the rest of it. So he didn't get it from there. Uh, he wasn't paying attention to tea masters or something. It just came. The instinct for it was there. Uh, it's like a default mode. And of course, it became Japan's greatest contribution in modern times to dance, right? But it's pure so, and no other no other country comes close. Now I'm going to have to um, 
pull up a slideshow um, of my own um, so that they know what we're talking about. But yes. um, from the YouTube audience, we have um, a question. Um, I'm noticing a that there's um, sort of like empty space um, in art and home architecture. Why is the, um, that there's empty space? Or what's, what, what's up with this, you know, like um, focus on empty space all the time? Okay, well, there, there may be three things going on. <laughs> One is uh, the, the paint, what I would call painted empty space. That is to say, uh, the idea that the emptiness is part of the painting goes all the way back to China and is an important aspect of Chinese traditional painting. And that came into Japan. Uh, so that is a, in a sense, a Pan-Asian idea, right? Then the second thing is uh, wooden architecture with its openness and lack of, of walls, which did not happen in China, which is it had wooden pillars, but the rest of it is brick, you know, with plant, it was more walled in. But Southeast Asian architecture, uh, which is what came to Japan. So the house that you're that you're looking at behind me is uh, uh, fundamentally very close to what you would see in uh, in Indonesia or in Thailand, and and especially the house up in Ia with its black wooden floors, right? And of course, those houses are empty spaces. L let me go back to uh, once again. Let's look at the uh, at the house in Ia. Oops, sorry, wrong one. here. You know, there's nothing there. And I have over the years brought furniture and paintings and screens and all kinds of things up to try to decorate this place and it rejects them all. It does not want stuff. And that's true in Thailand as well, where these where rooms and houses that look almost exactly like this are empty traditionally. Even lords and, and kings lived like this. Uh, so I think again, I think it has something to do with that openness uh, and the and the sheer. In other words, if if you have no walls, where are you going to hang a painting? You know, <laughs> uh, if it's just one big open floor, where are you going to put the chair? Uh, it doesn't lend itself to things, right? And then the third aspect is again Shingyo So. So uh, despite their interest in emptiness, in fact, the Chinese tended to fill every square inch with, with you know, decorative frills. Uh, I call it the Chinese horror vacui, you know. Uh, it's a Latin phrase that means horror of the vacuum. Uh, so think of Chinese furniture, especially in more recent times where every, it's just carved with Baroque uh, filigree, you know, everywhere. Uh, whereas the Japanese, kept reverting back to so, which is simple, undecorated, uh, you know, open space. So those three things have somehow crisscrossed. And so you get a lot of it in Japanese art and certainly in the houses. Um, I do think that um, this, um, I, you know, this sense of empty space, that has been kind of a signature though, um, of, or, or seen in the West as being a kind of signature of Japanese art in general, right? Um, you know, like uh, these um, uh, Fusuma paintings, you know, there's a lot, you know, you notice there's a lot of square footage that they need to take up. And so, you know, you have these like, you know, you have this pine, you know, sorry, this like plum tree and, you um, but there's a lot of extra, you know, like the plum tree is not, you know, fully leafed out and uh, and it's not also in the center. It's kind of, you know, sort of you, you talk about the diagonal. So it does seem to be like a signature of Japanese art to emphasize this empty space to a certain extent. Oh, very much so. And being off center is, remember, Shingyo So, Shin would be symmetrical, putting it right in the middle. Gyo would be a little variation, but So would be putting it on the side. And for example, in the tea ceremony with flower arrangement, if you put the flower arrangement right in the center underneath the scroll, like that white bowl behind me, can you see it? Whoops. There's a scroll with a white bowl in front of it. That's a shin placement of the bowl. If you set it a little to the side, it's good. If you put it all the way in the corner, it is a so 
replacement for which you would, for example, use a basket rather than a ceramic <laughs> because it's you'd have the sew basket with a sew placement. And so putting things a little on the side, uh, shifting them off center, that's a so attitude to life. Mm. And so that's everywhere in Japanese art. It's interesting, Alex, that you should you know talk about a so attitude to life because um, one of our YouTube um, watchers is um, asking the question, which aspect of traditional Japanese culture most needs to be shared with the younger generation to make the world a better place? Ooh, <laughs> that's a huge one. Well, oddly enough, I wouldn't say it's so because I, but Shingo and so are all equally valuable. And remember, I also happen to love Chinese ar architecture and, and art and so on. And so I've got a Shin side as well as a So side. And I think everybody does, actually. Uh, I think we all have those sides. And remember that those two artists told me that within uh, Fukami, the extremely polished Celadon guy, said within my Shin is that kind of outrageous, playful So. And then uh, uh, Raku told me within my uh, rough, you know, sort of crude Raku is actually a, an extremely reserved and, and formal Shin. So within Shin is so, and within so is Shin. And, and, and I think that's instinctual to all of us, so I'm not sure it needs to be passed on or anything. It's just there. What I would love to see passed on is Japan's traditional, it's gone now largely within Japan, but the traditional attitude to nature uh, such such as you see uh, in those open sp roomed uh, uh, spaces where where the, the outside is part of the inside and and, th and that's why the confusion arose that the painting inside was the same thing as the garden outside because it really did feel that they were uh, the, all the same world. Um, Japan's attitude towards trees to moss uh, those things are are incredibly valuable. And, and, and Japan has a lot to offer there, or had. Unfortunately, it's losing it, but, but those things are still to be found. And, and, uh, and those are what I'd like to see passed on. It's, um, it's hard to argue with the idea that we should spend more, you know, concentrate more on trees and moss and things like that. Like, I have a feeling that if our trees and moss are healthy, um, we'll do pretty good, but if we can't keep our trees and moss healthy, we may not be able to keep ourselves healthy either. Um, this afternoon um, in my class, one of the things that the students um, um, pointed out is that, um, and and you in your um, in your another Kyoto book, you you also pointed out that so you can sort of like fiddle with the shape of the fusuma, you know, and like turn it, you know, like into an outside and an inside, you know, you have this thing where you can put the mountains in the middle or you can put the mountains on the side. But also my students were noticing that um, in one of the fusuma that we were looking at in class, um, it seemed as though um, the, um, the plum tree was actually making an arc so that once you open the door, you'd be sort of walking through kind of a metaphorical sort of like, um, under a metaphorical plum arch. Um, anyway, I wonder if you um, could comment a little bit on um, the kinds of, I mean, like the, the sort of the spatial layout of Fusuma in, in this regard. Um, I don't know that, that people thought too much conceptually about the arch should be this way or that. I think that they just had a huge space and they were gonna do something really dramatic with it. And so they would slash the diagonal or they'd arch it over the top. You know, uh, it was drama. Uh, that's what screen painting was. Uh, sc uh, screen painting and also uh, a Fusma painting. Or remember it's Shin Gyo So, they might do an extremely detailed and formal Chinese landscape, painting in every leaf. But even then, there would be that element of towering mountains and, and a broad open sea or something. And they would uh, not uh, put them all together. The mountains would be all squeezed on one side, maybe. And then you'd have a bit of open sea. They would still play with the space so as to 
uh, so it wouldn't get boring, right? If you just spread that landscape out with mountains everywhere, what's that? But if you've distributed it, suddenly you get a dynamism. So I think they were into the drama and into the dynamism. And, uh, and so you ended up with, with multiple uh, forms and approaches. Uh, they would take one uh, uh, pine branch and, and stretch it for, you know, 25 feet uh, across a whole, you know, a row of eight fusma. Alex, we have a question from one of our YouTube audience members. Um, and it's, um, what would you say is the main difference between traditional Southeast or um, East Asian or Southeast Asian art in contrast with traditional Western art? Uh, okay, I wonder if this question is East Asian or Southeast Asian? Uh, I it's would, Southeast Asian, but I'm not, uh, is that really what they meant? Could, could, was it Michael who asked that? Michael, can yeah. you? Like Scout is trying to ask this. Um, Michael is, um, Because it's a little bit different, right? Uh, Southeast, okay. Southeast. Um, well, certainly in the case uh, there, um, okay, in the case of Thai art, let's stick with Thai for the moment. Uh, Thai art in, in every genre, whether it's in architecture or in painting or in uh, flowers and so on, is highly incremental. It's, uh, it's Lego art. <laughs> it's bits and pieces and they're pasted together and, cr and you create from that a fantasy universe, a fantasy world. Thai art is, is, a f is fantasy oriented. And, uh, and there's plenty of fantasy in Western art, but it's not so much a, a key, it's, it's a sideline. The reason it mattered in Thailand was because uh, the Thais were trying to recreate on earth a vision of heaven, of a sparkling heaven at the peak of sacred Mount Meru, uh, which is emerald colored and, uh, and sparkles with many rays of light. And even the creatures that live on Mount Meru are not normal uh, animals. You know, they're strange hybrids. Uh, and, and that's what features in the art. And, and you won't find that so much in Western or, or certainly in Chinese or Japanese. So that's something distinctive. Now I see it says, the question says, East Asian, right? Japan, China. Uh, what, are the, what are the big differences? Ooh, well... One of the biggest differences in painting would certainly be the use of the brush, right? The calligraphic brush. And the fact that the, the, be, because it was focused on, on the expressive use of, of the Chinese brush, uh, you developed very different techniques of painting. Uh, and this is, for example, why you didn't end up with, with, with an interest in, in, in painting anyway, in, in 3D Renaissance style, um, you know, uh, illusionistic representation, right? As if they looked real, because uh, they weren't interested in looking real. They were interested in suggesting the real through a few creative brushstrokes. Uh, one thing that uh, Donald Ritchie once said to me about comparing Japanese. Alex, uh, can I get in here for a second? Can oh. you just tell your re readers quickly who Donald Ritchie is? Ah. I mean, your viewers. Ah uh, yes, Donald Ritchie was one of the great writers of Japan and one of my mentors, and wrote the definitive books on Japanese film, and was a close friend of Hiji Kata and everybody. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, so this Donald Ritchie was critically involved in uh, in the new contemporary culture of Japan as it developed from the seventies, the sixties onwards. Um, but one thing he said to me, and he was actually talking about movies. Uh, but but I think it applies to prints, paintings, and the rest. He said, uh, Western art is representational. We're trying to show something. Japanese art is presentational, meaning that it's giving you an image, but it's not supposed to necessarily be a real human being or a landscape or anything else. Uh, it's another level of abstraction, really. And, and that's haunted me, that phrase of his. And I think that might even apply to Chinese art as well, uh, that, that it is 
presentational and not representational. And so maybe that's one of the biggest differences. And some of that may have come, again, I have this tendency to, <laughs> uh, to look not so much at the, the kind of inner psychology of it and all that, but just to look at how did people live? What utensil did they use to paint with? And then what did that lead to? And you know, you pick up the brush and it's got a lot of ink in it and you have a sheet of white paper and what are you gonna do? Well, it's not going to be Leonardo. It's going to be a completely different approach. So Alex, I wonder if I might um, follow up, um, you know, on this idea of the brush. Um, uh, and, and, and this does, in a way, get back to the Shingyo. So we're talking about um, writing systems, but we're talking about writing systems where how the writing looks is extremely important. Um, and not just, so it's not just that the writing is conveying some information, but how yeah. the writing looks is important. I wonder if you could comment a little bit about on like how, you know, this sort of like Chinese and Japanese writing and Korean is, you know, like they, yeah. you know, they have this, how this writing system where how the writing looks really matters. I mean, of course we have fonts and stuff like that, but I have a sense that like um, the alphabet systems, um, how it ma looks doesn't matter quite as much. Could you yeah. say a few words about that? Uh, of course, the big exception of that is Islamic writing. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Arabic. Mm -hmm. Arabic, which has a huge tradition of calligraphy, right? Uh, yes. But but we'll just set that aside for the moment because th th I, I, that is kind of a special exception. Generally speaking, alphabets don't didn't go that way. And I think it's because... Uh, Structurally, of course, kanji are much more complex, right? So you can do more with it. That's one thing. But secondly, each one is a discrete thing and it jumps into your eye and, and it has a kind of world of nuance around it. Whereas an alphabet, you're putting pieces together, which is why we, uh, for example, there's not much dyslexia among the Chinese because they're not arranging bits and pieces to make a word. In the, in, mentally, that's not what's going on. The word is already there, fully formed. Uh, and because the word, the word is already there, fully formed, it's a piece of art. It's, it has a meaning, it stands for something. And then once they develop the different levels, the Shingyo So ways of writing it, then you're off and running with artistic expression. All right. Uh, we have another um, question. Um, which is what is your favorite painting or piece of art that you've discovered through your time doing this? <laughs> oh <laughs> my gosh. Uh, well, you know, uh, there, to throw out a few, Ensuji Garden, which I showed, would be one of my all time favorite uh, things in Japan that I never tire of going to see. So that would be one. In fact, a couple of them I showed. The other is the Sand Garden at Daisen Inn which is the ultimate abstraction, you can't get any further. Just two mounds of white sand, and that's it. Uh, and so that's extreme. I, I, I saw that when I was 12 and I never got over it. Um, and so those things are, are very uh, powerful. Um, I mean, it's endless. Uh, Kichiemon's uh, 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 ceramics, and for both of those two uh, ceramic artists, uh, every piece that either one of them has ever made uh, is is just viscerally uh, fascinating to me. Um, so uh, Japan is is rich in these things. I could. Uh, do you have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we have another hour. Okay. Um, all right. So um, unless we have you know some burning question. Um, uh, oh, there is a, a burning question. Um, this is, do you think that Japanese animation's influence comes from Disney and things like post-war Looney Tunes stylistically? Well, you could probably answer this better than me. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, my in, here's my instinct about it, right? <clears throat> Remember, nothing in Japan started in Japan. It always came from China or somewhere. And however, you, you have this kind of curve. So for example, the influence of, of uh, Chinese poetry came into Japan. They, and for hundreds of years, they wrote Chinese poems. And then at some point they switch 
and they're now writing Japanese poems. And the same thing happened with painting. So they started out doing that very Chinese style Shin painting and the next thing you know, whoop, it's gone so. And so I think my guess would be that uh, probably they did get it from Disney and Looney Tunes and the rest, but it, then it switched and the Japanese mode then took over using techniques that they got from somewhere else. And maybe you would, uh, you, you would, as I say, know more about this. Well, I'll, um, I'll leave that um, longer discussion to a, a future day. Um, another um, thing is someone wants to say, tell us about the art behind you. It looks cool. <laughs> uh, thank you, whoever pulled that. Uh, well, okay, let me get my head out of the way. So we're looking at uh, a couple things. The scroll is, is a boy riding home on his ox. And it's one of the so-called uh, ten bull pictures mm. of Zen. And the first one is you see the bull, or you seek the bull, then you see the footprints, you see the bull, you conquer the bull, or you tie up the bull, and then the, you, and then the liberate the moment of liberation, riding home on the bull, which is what we're looking at. Under it is a white ceramic tea bowl. The calligraphy is by me, and it means hidden, hidden darkness, which was the ideal of no drama, Yugen. Let me turn it a bit so you can see the, whoops, the whole thing, Yugen, there. Oh, yes. Um, which curiously, hidden darkness was the ideal of no drama, but, but Buto began as Ankoku Buto, right? Dance of darkness. So again, uh, so by default somehow, uh, they, they go for the darkness. I'm gonna to have to give my um, students a, a unit on Buto in the manga and anime class after this. <laughs> um, Alex, I think we're um, we've used a lot of your time. This has been fantastic. Um, like it's so enlightening. Thank you so much for taking your time here. And then I think we can give this back over to Michael to close it out for us. But thank you again so very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Alex and Bruce. That was amazing, um, as always. Um, thank you to our audience. Um, really quick, just going to mention uh, the this has been brought to you uh, primarily at the Fine Arts Center through the Asian and Asian American Arts and Culture Program. Um, it's been going for 27 years now, um, originally founded and um, directed by uh, Ranjana Devi. Um, and we have three more programs uh, in the series this year. Um, on February 24th at 7, the Stitch and Bitch Community Craft Night with performance artist Christina Wong, who then performs uh, live the following Monday, March 1st at 7, uh, in her, sh her new show, Christina Wong Sweatshop Overlord. Both events uh, highlight the Anti Sewing Squad, which is Christina's, um, which is the nationwide mutual aid campaign, making masks and providing clothing and things like that, and PBEs to frontline workers and at-risk communities throughout the country. Um, also on April 6th, uh, Miwa Matreik, an intermediate performance artist, Japanese American, uh, featured in her intermediate performance, Infinitely Yours, along with uh, some of her students uh, at UMass, uh, who will be uh, and in the schools who are developing uh, work along with her this semester and then the next day on a panel with uh, climate scientists for our climate uh, change partnership for transforming crisis. Uh, so thank you to Mass Cultural Council for supporting our program all these years. Um, again, um, Alex, Bruce, this has been great. Um, and um, our audience, please uh, join us throughout the season tomorrow night, our performing arts season premieres. Uh, February 17th at 7 p.m. with a, a special command performance exclusive to UMass of the amazing global legends Lady Smith Black Mombazo uh, choral group from South Africa. So please, please join us for that. And um, I think that's it. And thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.